I'm Colleen Sullivan. I work for the DNR and I am serving as the president for the Wetland Professionals Association this year. And today we've got um, for a forum, we've got speakers to talk about three different wetland restoration projects. So we're looking forward to that. We've got the Lake Superior site, the Palisades site, and the Mater Farm site. So um, we're going to start with the Lake Superior site. And this presentation will provide updates on the progress of the Lake Superior Wetland Mitigation Bank as it advances through the monitoring period. It will focus on observations of vegetation and hydrology changes. The bank was originally ditched and partially drained in the early 1900s in an effort to convert the area into productive farmland. The efforts failed to produce the desired farmland, but altered the hydrology and the plant communities of the larger peatland. The restoration effort of these lands will ultimately restore and protect over 20,000 acres contiguous with the internationally renowned Sac and Bog Important Bird Area. Our speakers today are Erica Massa and Natalie White with SEH. Um, Erica is a biologist with SEH based out of Duluth. Her work consists of wetland bank monitoring, wetland delineation, and wetland permitting services. She's held this position for two years. Prior to that, she worked as a project fisheries biologist with the Wisconsin DNR, a graduate researcher at the Thousand Islands Biological Station and a scientific aide with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. She holds a BS in biology from the U of M Duluth and an MS in fish and wildlife biology uh, and management from the State University of New York, the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, Natalie White is a senior biologist and botanist with SEH based out of Duluth. For the last 10 years, she works on Wetland mitigation banks, wetland permitting, delineation, and botanical survey. Prior to working at SEH, she assisted with Waka LGU duties and operations maintenance at the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Natalie is a professional wetland scientist and DNR approved surveyor for general flora. She holds a BS in biology from Iowa State University and an MS in biology from the University of Minnesota Duluth. So welcome. Erica and Natalie. Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is Erica Massa. Um, today, myself and my colleague Natalie White are going to be presenting an update on the Lake Superior Wetland Bank. I'm going to start off with a little bit of project background and some of our hydrology restoration, and then Natalie will take over with the vegetation response. So uh, the Lake Superior Wetland Bank is located in St. Louis County near the Saxon Bog. It encompasses over 25,000 acres and 40 square miles. The area is located in a former glacial lake bed, and so it uh, historically was very flat and boggy. Um, beginning in the 1920s, the area was ditched for agricultural purposes, and over 70 miles of ditch were present on site. So here's just some examples of the types of ditches that were located uh, on the site. So these are some small lateral ditches uh, running east to west. And this is what those look like from above. Uh, this is a typical medium sized ditch um, and an excavator in the background for a scale. And here's what those look like from above. <clears throat> And then we also, uh, there were also larger ditches on the site. So this is actually the outlet of the site. And you can see just how uh, deeply incised the ditch channel is in comparison to the surrounding land. So I know many of you are probably familiar with the project. So I'm kind of gonna breeze through the uh, restoration and um, but if anybody is not familiar, there was a full length WPA forum that was presented in 2018 and that's available on YouTube. So if anybody has trouble finding that, they can email me and I will send out the link. Um, the restoration plan included filling the ditches to stop, stop drainage using root wads and trees and also soil. Uh, we used the trees on site near the ditches because they would probably be drowned out um, following the restoration. 
we constructed ditch checks to slow down the surface water. And the theory behind this was to restore the hydrology, which then would re restore the ecology. Um, again, I'm gonna breeze through these construction steps, but prior to construction, the ditches are open and functioning as they draw water um, off the site. During construction, trees are placed within the channel to stop the flow and completely fill the channel. And then where available, spoil or borrow is placed over the top to again, completely fill those channels. And then this is a photo showing construction of a ditch check, which was used to slow down and disperse surface water. So here's a photo example of one of the larger ditches on site. This is ditch M05 uh, prior to construction in July of 2015. And here is that same site um, immediately post-construction in September of 2015. So that hydrology response was pretty immediate. And then looking at five years post-restoration, uh, this is what it looked like in July of 2020. So conditions are typically saturated at the ground surface. Um, there are some areas that have um, more standing water and the vegetation has recovered. Here's another example. This photo was taken in 2015 and it shows a section of ditch that was restored and then a section of ditch um, on the other side of the road that was not restored. So again, this is just showing that that hydrology response is pretty immediate. So we use wells and pressure transducers to measure hydrology. Um, these are dispersed throughout the site to capture a range of conditions. And we collected data for two years pre-construction and then every year since, uh, so we can make those pre and post comparisons. This is a typical well transect setup. So we have uh, wells placed within the, the existing ditches and then extending into the generally undisturbed areas. And here's just a photo showing uh, a well located in one of the ditches and then extending into those undisturbed areas. So now we'll get into some of the hydrology results. Um, I wanted to show this slide. This is how we used to present our hydrology data. Um, we would make these figures in Microsoft Excel where each of the different colored lines represents um, a different year. But as you can tell, it's not super intuitive to seeing how the hydrology is changing over time. Um, so we switched our approach. And now we present our data this way. So we make our figures in R and R Studio, and we plot each year uh, chronologically for the entire growing season, which is uh, May 1st to October 31st. Um, this well is well six, so it was located in a former lateral ditch that was filled. Um, and you, you'll see the horizontal blue dashed line, that's at uh, zero, so that's like our, our ground surface. And then the horizontal dashed red line is negative 12. So in between those two um, numbers is our range for wetland hydrology. So. You can see for 2013 and 2014, our pre-restoration years, that um, the ditches were inundated, there was surface water present, um, and then post-restoration, the water is drawn down, um, the ditches are displaying more of a saturated condition, and they're uh, less variable, so our uh, variability has gone down. Here's another example. So this is well 15. So well 15 is located within the um, lateral effect zone or the subsidence zone um, of a ditch. And prior to restoration, the water table is drawn down for most of the growing season. And you can see that it fluctuates greatly. Um, it's highly variable. Um, post restoration, you can actually see that rebound in 2016 of hydrology and um, the areas near the ditches are wetter and generally more stable. And this is one last example. So well 49 is um, a well that is placed the furthest from the ditch in our, this transect. Uh, so this would be considered one of those um, generally undisturbed areas. 
but even in those areas, we did see a response to the restoration. So um, the water table is more stable, um, in some areas wetter, um, in others unchanged, but uh, generally staying within that wetland hydrology range for the growing season. This slide is just showing in table form what we see in our figures. Um, so the top table is showing um, our hydrology data grouped by well location. So whether it was located in a ditch um, within that subsidence zone or outside of the subsidence zone. And then for two years, so 2014 is used as our pre-restoration year and 2020 as our five-year post-restoration year. The first column shows our average depth to water. So we can see that for the ditches um, in 2014, the average depth to water was about 12 inches of inundation. Um, and then looking over to 2020, that, that average depth to water is, is gone down to about 0.6. Um, for the wells that are located within the subsidence zone, these areas have gotten wetter. And then outside of the subsidence zone, it's generally unchanged. And if you look at the second column, that's our standard deviation, so our measure of variability, and that has also been reduced post-restoration. So the, the top set of tables are including all the dates, um, but we wanted to look at climate as well. So we uh, just selected the dates that were within the normal precipitation range, and that's that second set of tables. And again, we see those same patterns uh, when we control for climate. So overall, hydrology on the site has changed to become wetter. Uh, the water table is closer to the ground surface and it stays that way for longer throughout the growing season. And generally, it's more stable overall. And here's just a slide showing that, um, that outlet ditch uh, in its pre-restoration state versus what it looks like today. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and hand things over to my colleague, Natalie White. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I am, um, Erica and I are sharing this presentation uh, and I have, uh, I've been, collecting vegetation data at the Superior Bank since uh, since pre-construction in 2013 and 2014. So I'm here to talk about the vegetation response to the uh, to the hydrology restoration and the, the hydrology conditions that Erica described. Um, and it's been um, it's been really interesting to see what's happening out there. Uh, as Erica alluded to, the kind of concept for the site was to restore the hydrology and set the site on a trajectory to a more natural uh, plant community and hydrology regime. So we didn't do any um, direct, any real direct modification of the vegetation as far as seeding or installing native plants. The site was mostly native species uh, to begin with, definitely less than 5% invasive species. Um, it was mostly wetland vegetation. So we're restoring the site in that we're bringing back a more natural hydrology regime and hopefully native plant communities that are more typical of what that landscape should look like. Um, but our first goal in, in vegetation for this site was to do no harm because it always, already looked um, very native and, and wetland hydrophyte dominated. So, in response to the hydrology restoration uh, construction, we could see a few things immediately in pretty short order. Uh, so I'll talk about those first, and then there are some things that we expect to see maybe on a much greater greater time scale. Um, so as you can imagine, areas that were directly disturbed, where trees were pulled, where the excavators were moving around, um, where any material was brought in to construct checks, those we saw um, and were watching for an immediate response and, uh, and wanted to know what was happening there. And then in turn, with a little more time, we'll see a vegetation response to the, the higher and more stable water table. And you know we expect to see that more quickly where the change is more dramatic adjacent to the ditches. Um, and then maybe over the long term, 
uh, we'll also see a, a vegetation change uh, where there were more subtle effects farther from the ditch. Um, and then maybe also in the very long term, we'll see changes in vegetation based on ultimate changes in the mineral and nutrient content of the water on the site as it is less influenced by uh, mineral and nutrient wit rich surface inflows. So we've got to somehow quantify those vegetation changes for monitoring. Uh, and one way that we did that was uh, plot based plot based veg monitoring. Um, we started out with or over time had 112 or 113 vegetation plots out on the site. Uh, some of which after construction, once there was that immediate inundation response, they became uh, all but inaccessible for a while. So we, we don't have perfect repeatability of every site, but we do have 78 plots that we visited pre and post construction. And what I'm showing here, um, the tables, you're not meant to be able to read each uh, individual number, but we were looking at floristic quality, um, which measures based on um, the species in the plot, if they have high affinity to a, a specific undisturbed plant community, then that they would have a high C value and the resultant metrics for the plot are, uh, are higher. Uh, whereas a species that you could find growing in any, in a variety of different plant communities would have a low C value. So the idea was let's try to make sure at least the floristic quality indices um, and metrics, they don't go down. Let's hope that they stay the same or ideally get better. And the color coding here is uh, green and yellow are improved or about the same from pre-construction conditions. Um, and we did have a few that uh, decreased in those metrics since construction. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So here's what the, what the direct disturbance looks like. Um, the picture on the left is one of the larger areas of ground disturbance out there. Um, something that we were watching, you know, as anybody would be for, let's make sure we don't have invasive species coming in or, you know, watchful for what we have recolonizing the site. And um, really quickly after construction, we were gratified to see that things were coming back. Uh, the, the picture on the right shows a like typical recolonization of the fill or ditch check where you've got wild calla, uh, northern blue flag, and you get some itty bitty sphagnum regenerating on the ground surface there. And those um, FQA metrics for areas like that were probably pretty similar pre and post construction. Um, species that were native and uh, native hydrophytes, but not necessarily those with really high uh, conservatism. Here's an example. This picture is from an area um, a little farther in the bank site from the margins where the, the ditching was less intense. The floristic quality uh, metrics to begin with were a little higher or a lot higher, I should say, in some places. Um, and so that was somewhere where we also are, we're watching carefully for, let's make sure we're not uh, negatively affecting the area. And so this was a spot that had typical bog vegetation. Um, there's some bog birch out there, stunted tamarack and black spruce. Where trees were pulled out, it came back, you know, this shot from one year post-construction is a sea of wool grass, which is uh, a native hydrophyte, but definitely has a, a lower C value than those typical bog species. As you know, you can see wool grass almost anywhere. But thankfully, looking underneath that sea of wool grass, we had sphagnum coming back in the ground layer. So even though this FQA plot might be one where we saw the metrics decrease from pre and post construction, um, we're very hopeful that what we see coming back um, is reflected by this, this sphagnum coming back into the ground layer and that, uh, that we've got a site that is going to be hospitable to the species we want to see there. And I think a lot of that sphagnum regeneration um, really helpfully came from using Tamarax with the whole root wad for ditch fill. It, brought a lot of sphagnum into the ditch as they were being filled and it gives a source for it to colonize from the middle of the ditch out as well from the margins in. So that's been uh, 
really moving along nicely and I've been happy to see how that looks. So here's it where we're maybe starting to see the beginning of some of these longer term effects. Um, Erica mentioned the expectation that some of the tamaracks were gonna drown out next to the ditches with the increase in the water table. Um, they're just you know, not gonna be as happy. They don't have as much of a zone that's aerated around their roots. And you can see here as the flow starts to go across in a more natural pattern instead of being intercepted by the ditch that those tamaracks are starting to die or starting to be stressed. Um, and that's a little longer term response. And then, you know, what I'll be interested to see in a very long term response is we might start to see stress in those more mature trees in areas that don't necessarily correlate to being uh, right along the ditch or influenced by the geometry of the ditch. But if we start to see features that look like water tracks where we're seeing bands of tamarack looking stressed, um, as we're maybe seeing redevelopment of uh, patterned peatland in some areas where the ditches interrupted that, uh, that feature of the site. Um, I wanted to put in a quick slide about management because I know folks are probably curious about it. Um, invasive species were present at a pretty low percentage of the site. Um, and we're th through the hydrology restoration, we're hopeful that we are making an inhospitable site for these species that were there, the cattail and reed canary grass, glossy buckthorn. And we have indeed seen that um, reed canary grass and glossy buckthorn certainly aren't increasing in response to construction and, you know, we're kind of doing some watchful waiting that uh, as the site is less hospitable to them, they're gonna become less of a component. Um, hybrid cattail, kind of the same thing. The bulk of the site shouldn't be hospitable to the cattails, but certainly with more inundation, and there certainly always are gonna be areas on the margins and the inflows of the site that are more nutrient rich. It's something that we're watching and planning to do herbicide treatment for. Um, and that's something that we will just have to keep on and then as I want to run through a few acknowledgements, um, certainly there's a ton of people that work on uh, a site like this and I'm not going to get everybody, but yeah, certainly the bank sponsor for allowing us to design and monitor this site. It's been a great experience. Uh, and then definitely uh, a shout out to our construction uh, crew and uh, Steve Gilbertson for, they had some amazing, uh, construction equipment out there with low pressure, giant tracks on um, excavators that allowed them to construct these ditches with such a minimal uh, ground disturbance and effect on the site. And I think given the amount of time I've taken, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over this video, but I think we could probably send out the, the link for folks to watch a, uh, a drone flight down one of the ditches. And with that, I will, say thank you and uh, and certainly take any questions that you might have for me or Erica. Okay, thank you. It looks like one question just came in and it is, uh, can you explain the crediting and how that was arrived at? For example, the ratio used with the number of acres. Did all the site acres get a percentage credit or only acres that were documented to have restored hydrology, hydrology and or improved FQA? Thanks, that is an excellent question. Um, and it could probably be a full WPA forum all on its own. I know that um, Derek Deichel uh, is the SEH project manager for this project. And he, I think he showed a slide in his previous presentation with a giant flow chart of how things were documented for what the crediting for the site should be. Um, and a lot of the pre-project data collection went into identifying what areas were appropriate to be called, uh, you know, rehab versus uh, restoration versus preservation. And I, I think ultimately, um, and you know, the, I don't want to speak out of turn because I wasn't as closely involved in the crediting, but, uh, and some other folks who are watching the forum today might know better than me, but, uh, there was a lot of thought put into what the effect of the ditches on the site were and so what was appropriate for restoration credit versus preservation. 
And I think uh, ultimately maybe we came down to uh, kind of an average of like six or 800 feet out from the ditch was a zone that seemed to show a really obvious effect of the ditching. Uh, and those areas were credited higher than areas farther away from the ditch that would be more appropriately termed preservation. Great, um, that looks like to be the last question there. Uh, so uh, next presenter. Next, we're gonna have the uh, Palisade Wetland Mitigation Site. And the Palisade site is in Aiken County. It's a 1400 acre site that had been partially drained by ditches along section and half section lines. A previous restoration design for the site was completed in 2012 without eliminating the ditches and instead relying on the construction of berms to contain water within the fields. In 2016 and 17, the site was modified to backfill 10 miles of ditches and eliminate about three miles of private roads. Dan Tix will discuss the benefits of eliminating the ditches and minimizing grading alterations to most closely restore the natural hydrology. Dan will also review some of the challenges with vegetation management on the site, including challenges with tree establishment and cattail control. So our speaker is Dan Tix, who's a senior wetland ecologist at BAR. Dan has about 22 years of professional experience in natural resources and ecology, assisting clients with wetland permitting, mitigation, delineation, and monitoring. His work has included ecological restoration design and planning, botanical and wetlands, including calcareous fen identification, preparation of calcareous fen management plans, and natural resources management planning. So welcome, Dan. Thank you, Colleen. I'm hoping everyone can hear me and see my screen. If not, have to let me know somehow. Um, <clears throat> so as she mentioned, I'll be talking about the Palisade Wetland Mitigation Site. She knows plenty about this one also. Um, second version of it. Okay. And there we go. Oh, all right. So the summary of what I'm gonna touch base on today is uh, kind of the construction lessons. Um, there's many because we did it, uh, because it was done twice, uh, once by, by someone else uh, working for the same client, and then <clears throat> once again by us after we got to the site and saw some problems that I'll go into. Um, and then um, I'll also talk about some of the, the vegetation establishment problems we had. Um, some of it was uh, with cattail. Uh, we tried to control those as much as we could and just based on, just with the, the alterations to the site and not providing their habitat. Um, but then also uh, I'll talk about tree, shrub, tree and shrub survival um, and how we've done with um, planting those, which hasn't gone very well. Um, so background on the site, it's about 1,400 acres in Aiken County. Uh, it used to be a tamarack swamp. Um, rumor from one of the neighbors is that there was a wildfire in the 1970s and that led the landowner um, or actually somebody else to swoop in and buy the property uh, with the hopes of being able to then farm it. Um, he tried to, <clears throat> to set ditches in it and farm but it has extensive peat and muck soil. So it, it was all always kind of um, uh, farmed wetland or you know too wet to, to really grow a lot of good crops on. Um, another rumor from another neighboring farmer was that it was just an insurance farm. They farm for crop subsidies. True that is, but hey, it's an interesting uh, concept. Um, the, many of the ditches are actually double ditches, a ditch road ditch on the section lines. And so we'll look at some of those. Here's the site um, in Aiken County, north of McGregor, about five miles and uh, three miles west of, or east of uh, Palisade, Minnesota. You know where the Larson Barn Dance is, just south of Rat Lake. Uh, and you have been there already, close to it. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the discussion, I'm going to focus on just this section 
of the site, just so we're not complicating the, the full site in different areas. And I'll talk a lot about this um, ditch road ditch combination, this double ditch, um, <clears throat> and how we change the hydrology there. Uh, so talk about the first construction in 2012. Um, the ditches were maintained. They didn't uh, fill those ditches. They didn't plug them. Um, and instead they built berms around each of the, next to each of the uh, ditches um, to essentially contain water within what was, was considered nine different cells um, of the site with different fields um, that held water within them. Uh, and then they actually excavated some of the areas too uh, to create some low, lower spots, even lower than what was there. Uh, this is the 1939 aerial photo. Um, the site is roughly, this, the area I'm going to be talking about is roughly this rectangle. Um, it doesn't look like a tamarack swamp there, so I'm not sure how clear that rumor was from the neighbor. Um, and here in 2010, uh, another aerial photo from before we, any construction was done. You can see a lot of it was already farmed wetlands. And you can see a lot of it was was really flat, and especially within this cell. Here's that ditch road ditch combination on the north edge. Um, also, I should have remind should have mentioned um, if you hear some crazy noises in the background, that is somebody putting in windows in my house. So I, I I moved to my son's room to try to avoid that. So hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, but yeah, so the site is is really flat. Um, and within this cell, you know, this is a mile across and a half mile north south. Um, you basically have two feet of elevation difference. Um, and then you get these higher points along the roads on the north and south end, and then lower spots, obviously, in the ditches along the edges. Uh, so here's kind of a, a schematic of their uh, original design. Um, they built these berms all around uh, the ditches. The ditches on the edges were maintained, and so is the, the road uh, uh, around the whole cell. Um, the water would be contained within these berms, and they actually did some excavation here uh, in order to pull up um, material for um, building these berms. Um, <clears throat> and they also had just within what was designed to be their sedge meadow community, they had up to two feet elevation difference within that sedge meadow community. Uh, here's a typical cross section. It's not exactly the area I was just showing, but it's a typical of, of the whole site. Um, here you can see there's um, the upland area. There's almost three feet of fill to build these berms. Uh, and much of this was wetland along the ditch. Uh, so that was wetland fill. Um, some other high points were built up. The, this line here was the existing contours. And so the dark black line is the, um, the proposed design contours. And they actually uh, lowered some of the areas that were already pretty low. Um, and so their concept was that this would all I'll hold water uh, pretty much saturated at the surface um, and and slightly ponded in in these lower spots. <clears throat> um, here is an aerial photo after their first uh, the first year after construction just to show kind of the the areas of standing water uh, before vegetation is really getting established. Uh, a lot of these areas were designed to be sedge meadow, uh, including this um, sta area of standing water here and this area that was um, ended up being pretty high and dry. So wet meadow area was was quite wet also. By 2015, a lot of that vegetation had filled in. Um, it, a lot of it was cattails, we'll talk about later, but you can see the ditches are present. Upland berms you can kind of tell are just a little bit drier. Um, and then some of these areas of sedge meadow weren't really developing wetland hydrology. Uh, the 
we were finding out there in our first year of monitoring in 2014 that there were deep areas with two to four feet of standing water, um, like pretty extensive areas with that much standing water. And then there was still quite a bit that was zero to zero to two feet. Um, there was less wetland than expected. Some of those areas were pretty high. Um, and then they had outlets actually along the, the edges I didn't really talk about across the, the tops of these berms. And those did not do quite what they were expecting to do. Um, some of the outlets were too high and not draining any water. And some of the outlets were uh, probably too low and, and receiving large volumes of water and, and having some erosion problems on the, on the outlet side. So a lot of these things kind of needed to be repaired somehow. Um, and we decided to do a fairly major repair and take those berms along the edges of the site, uh, level those and knock them into the ditches to backfill the ditches, uh, hoping for uh, credits from the ditch backfill, also leveling roads where we could and getting um, wetland restoration credits for those areas since most of them were built in roads trying to eliminate as much of the deep marsh as we could um, and then creating more or just fewer large um, surface outlets and and thereby connecting the, the site hydrologically. Instead of the nine smaller cells, we tried to connect it into four large cells. We would have liked to do even fewer, but we had to maintain some of the ditches for neighbors. Uh, so here you can see in 2017, this was mid construction. Um, as I said, we're going for a kind of hydrologic connection across these two cells. It's actually three cells. There's a small one here and then this big one, um, trying to eliminate that ditch road ditch entirely. And then um, you can see here we they've started that. So the ditches are, are backfilled, the road is gone. Um, we're work, they're working their way across here. Again, this is mid construction. It's not quite done yet. Um, they've knocked down the, the berms on this east side and backfilled the ditch over here. You can see even on this cell, they've done, done a lot of that uh, ditch backfill, removing the berms. 2018, uh, this is with our um, record contours. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you can see that. Um, our record survey elevations. And so here you see that there those the ditch road ditch combination is gone completely. There's no ditch here. It's flat all the way across this 1226 contour the yellow line and that is kind of a critical one. Um, everything below that we would expect to be wetland. Our outlet was at 1224.7 um, we'd expect everything below 1226 <clears throat> approximately to be uh, pretty wet just from uh, saturation from this outlet elevation, but also because we've got uh, water standing up here, we've got really flat areas up here uh, and even some depressions to the north that would help um, saturate this soil throughout. So we were... Um, we were aiming for flat, um, and actually it's pretty uh, dramatic when you go up to this area. It is uh, looking across at where the, the ditch road ditch was. It's, it's amazingly flat out there. Uh, let's see. Am I stuck? There we go. So here's kind of the before and after um, showing the where the ditch road ditch was uh, before construction. Um, these are just LIDAR contours, uh, but then here is our record survey showing um, the flat, flat all the way across north to south and the, the hydrologic connection that we were aiming for. Um, I'm gonna talk about these wells, these P112 over here, uh, which, P112 before construction was in standing water. Essentially, it's hard to tell there, but that was that was in an area of like cattails. Um, 
And by the end of construction, uh, it was right about at 1226, that 1226 line. Um, <clears throat> and it was um, a, a lot less wet. There was, there was not gonna be standing water there. And then P115 was pretty much in the same spot. It, it um, we never moved it. Uh, so the, the change was that we got rid of the, the ditch road ditch um, and we did all the grading around it. So here's our hydrograph. It's um, a little bit complicated at the top. It's showing precipitation at the bottom. It's showing our, our elevation, our water elevations relative to the ground surface. Uh, the middle is just showing the, the hydro period when wetland hydrology was present. Um, but the P112 you see is this green line uh, and that had six to 18 inches of um, standing water almost all year uh, before the modifications in 2014. Uh, and then P115 uh, had really flashy um, water elevations even early in the growing season. Um, and even though uh, this was a wetter than normal uh, precipitation pattern early in the growing season and late in the growing season also. Um, but the this purple line here is the 30-day rolling average of precipitation and, and this gray is the, the um, normal range, so-called normal range. Um, so that was quite a wet period. And even with that wet period, it only had 17 days of wetland hydrology. Um, and in 2019, after the modifications, uh, a couple of years after things had started to settle down a bit, I, um, the colors have changed. Sorry about that. Um, but the P112 area had been filled. So this, um, this well, uh, the green line uh, is drier. We've moved the well essentially to pretty much the same spot and um, a lot more stable early growing season, um, just around six inches or a little bit shallower. Um, and then it does get flashy during the middle of the season, but kind of early and late season for both wells are, are relatively stable compared to uh, before construction. And you'll notice this year, uh, 2019 was <clears throat> relatively dry in that area. Uh, at the beginning of the growing season and and it didn't have nearly the flashiness and it really maintained the, the hydrology. So again, P115 was an area that we didn't directly modify, modified everything around it. So our takeaway from this was that backfilling those ditches completely was a great way to really get to the the contiguous wetland community that we wanted with more stable water levels throughout area connecting the, <clears throat> the hydrology across the site as much as we could. We also were able to reduce open water um, and shallower depths and that was actually a, a contingency of uh, some of the permit, um, <clears throat> the permits that we had that wouldn't allow credit for anything that had standing water because it was something the the agencies had had uh, frowned upon at the beginning of the project so um, that helped us to get more credits or is helping us to get more credits we haven't completely gotten them all yet but we're still working on it um, and it, it's looking promising for sure we also reduced a lot of that open reducing open that Reducing that open water also really helped with cattail problems um, throughout. Um, and I think one uh, important takeaway is uh, that you just try to minimize grading as much as possible. Uh, it reduces the cost, uh, maintain topsoil, uh, and helps with that natural, more natural topsoil. It really can help maintain consistent hydrology. You definitely don't want to um, do construction grading twice. That is um, not a good idea. I wouldn't recommend it. And, and our client definitely did not like that they had to do it a second time. Um, it, especially on a site this size when it was 
a million dollars of construction both times. So uh, the marshes that were created in this area, um, I'm gonna shift uh, course here a little bit and start talking about our vegetation. Um, the marshes that were created in the, on the site wound up creating quite a problem with uh, non-native cattails. Um, again, these were discouraged by the regulators, partly because the, these areas, um, standing, standing water marshes, um, because they really weren't historically present. Um, not direct, not, not in this immediate site. There were definitely um, marshes along lakes and rivers in the area, um, but not, not in the, the site where we were restoring. Uh, again, go back to the 2013 aerial, uh, just to see how much standing water there was and see how much it filled in by 2015. And, and that's almost entirely cattails um, in those those areas of standing water. Um, in 2019, even after our modifications, we still had areas of standing water uh, just because we the, those deep areas were too extensive to, to backfill. We had to make um, some compromises and we're we're doing everything we can to control cattails on especially on the larger areas. To do it, started with uh, two aerial applications, two years in a row, uh, uh, with a helicopter <clears throat> using uh, glyphosate. I think it was rodeo, uh, water soluble or a water safe uh, herbicide, and um, we had follow up spot treatments from the ground. Um, those are usually done in August, also, but it kind of depends on what we have low water that's that's the best time for them to get in there so they don't have to uh, they don't get stuck um, we haven't brought a, a marsh master or anything out uh, of course we all know what uh, area of cattails looks like but this is what it looked like in one section of the site uh, before we did any treatments uh, 2018 after a year of treatment uh, you can see the dead standing cattail stems um, and and some of the vegetation coming up. It's just spike rushes and and alisma coming in at this point. Uh, but then by 2020, a lot of that area had really filled in with uh, river bulrush, really dense. We still definitely have patches of cattails out there, but but some of the areas have um, really done better and, and I think a lot of it has to do with us uh, reducing the water levels um, but we still needed to control the cattails because they had such a good start in there I think it was going to take a long time for them to fade away um, but where we had less standing water where we have less standing water we tend to have uh, less cattails and really stay out after we've done our treatments. There's some areas that just still have a lot of standing water, uh, six or more inches of long duration standing water, and those still tend to have a lot of cattails. But we will be working on those still. Um, so a little summary on how we've done in the shallow marshes we've reduced um, in, in select areas of the shallow marshes, we've reduced from over 50% down to 7% on cattails um, and wet sedge meadows. It's It's been less of a drop, but we've also worked on it less hard. Um, and they have generally been replaced by diverse natives. Now, some of these areas that have just the, the low cover of cattails still um, have work to be done to come in with, with robust vegetation as opposed to uh, you know, alisma and spike rushes, which don't seem to have much uh, staying power, um, but we're, we're still hopeful. <coughs> now again, to shift over to trees and shrubs uh, quickly, um, the, we had some target communities that were hardwood swamp and, and or hardwood or conifer swamp and shrub car areas. Um, 2013, a lot of trees and shrubs were planted 
kind of throughout the site. Um, I don't know how many, but it was well over 20,000, I'm sure. In 2018 and 2019, we planted 12,000 seedlings in the fall and spring. Did that just so that we had it, had them going in at a different time to try to vary um, their survival chances, uh, depending on seasonality and, and uh, ability, um, and, and partly to test which ones would do better as much as we could. Um, <clears throat> so we do see some trees out there from the 2013 plantings, um, but uh, we're guessing less than probably 10% survival and maybe even less than like 2%, unfortunately. It's it's kind of sad out there. There's not very many trees. Um, they are doing better in many drier areas, uh, still generally in wetland. Um, but it's the drier wetlands that tend to, to still have trees. Um, and the 2018, 19 plantings, it's, it's still too early to tell survival from those two. Uh, we were out there the first year and looking at some of that, uh, mortality we could tell a lot of them were killed by voles and deer, uh, and, uh, there was desiccation in some of the because there were some dry periods that season, uh, I think it just dried up, especially in the areas that had been graded where we hadn't had uh, not as great uh, topsoil. I think there's still hope for some of these, but um, breath. Uh, the 2013 shrub plantings also appear to have had poor success. They did not plant any willow. Uh, when they did those 2013 plantings, they did these three species. Uh, I do see some red osier dogwood out there, and I've seen like a couple uh, of the um, viburnum species, but I've seen any chokeberry out there. But we see lots of willows, tons of willows that have come in by a, via natural recruitment. Uh, and I think our big takeaway there is that those have come in um, <coughs> in undisturbed soils where we done any grading, um, the soils have been protected. There's the native seed bank and everything that comes with, with good native topsoil. Um, this is an example of one of the areas or that same area and showing, you know, 140 acres have come in that we can now start calling shrub car community. Um, others are, are wet and sedge meadow where we just don't have a lot of the, the shrubs coming in, but we think that it will eventually move, that they will eventually move there. A lot of these areas had been graded, um, and we think it's just gonna be a slower uh, regeneration period. So uh, my final summary, uh, construction, do it once, minimize grading as much as possible, and then um, filling those ditches we think uh, is just a better way to go. It requires less engineering than a lot of ditch plugs or, or outlets. Um, and uh, it really gives you the contiguous hydrology across the site. Um, you also want to protect the soil as much as possible, which filling ditches and minimizing grading sometimes kind of conflict, but making a good balance of that, I think is, is definitely worth it. Cattails. Um, best to just avoid creating the habitat if possible. Uh, obviously, if you're creating a marsh, um, expect to have cattails and start controlling them immediately. Uh, trees and wetlands. I haven't <coughs> heard of many people having a lot of luck with these. I know it can work. Um, and I, one of the best methods is to maintain multiple strategies. Uh, many approaches start with seed, um, seedlings from uh, planted in different seasons, um, different species, a um, variety of species, and um, try protection from herbivores. I haven't had the best luck with protecting from herbivores, uh, but we didn't do it on, on this site. I've got uh, other sites where I've done it, and those um, seem to, sometimes those tree tubes can had cause problems for, for the trees themselves. So. Uh, shrubs, um, probably the same thing as trees if you're trying to plant them. 
Um, but uh, yeah, especially in northern Minnesota, you can often expect them um, from minimizing soil disturbance and allowing natural recruitment, which might just take a lot of hope. And it's pretty hard to predict which sites are going to do better than others. But sometimes you know based on the surroundings. That's good. So that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'm free to take them now, I think, if we have enough time. Yep. Thank you, Dan. I'm looking at the chat, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. Um, anyone has any, type them in now. But thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next present, um, project is the Mater Farm Wetland Restoration Bank. Um, the Mater Farm Wetland Restoration Project is 41 acres in size and is located in the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District in Hennepin County. The site contains historic wetlands that were drained and converted to cropland prior to restoration of high quality vegetation communities in 2017. The project was initiated in 2014 to assist the landowner in developing a plan for the site that prioritized restoration and preservation of natural areas while still allowing for development of adjacent areas that met local zoning requirements. A perspective from one of the landowners will <clears throat> describe the firm's history, steep learning curve about wetland restoration, the planning and costs associated with the project, and the sale of wetland credits. Wes Bull from Wank served as the family's consultant and will provide a summary of the technical work associated with the restoration project. So our speakers today are Packy Mater, um, the landowner and West Bull from Wank. Um, Packy is one of seven family member, family owner members of the farm, which was a dairy farm, and then rented to other area farmers beginning in 1996. He's a retired elementary school teacher who is an author and now a Minnesota master naturalist. And West Bull is a wetland scientist with 20 years of experience at Wank, which is now part of Stantec. Most of his work experience is with wetland regulation and mitigation, with a current focus on developing wetland banks in Minnesota and South Dakota. So welcome, Packy and Wes. Thanks, Colleen. <clears throat> yeah, as you mentioned, I'm going to just give a uh, brief summary overview of the Mater Farm uh, Wetland Bank, uh, the establishment and the uh, progress of the site where it's at now. Uh, before Packy uh, talks a little bit more about the uh, wetland banking process from the landowner's perspective. So I was the uh, consultant that helped uh, the Mater family with the uh, preparing the wetland bank plan, establishing the site, and then now have done the monitoring on the site for the last four years. So this site is located in the in western Hennepin County in the city of Minnetrista, uh, kind of just west of the western part of Lake Minnetonka. Um, it's also in the Minnehaha Creek watershed in the uh, far upper portion of the watershed in uh, Bank Service Area 7, Watershed 20, which uh, covers most of Hennepin County and the metro area. So this project um, all got started as a collaboration looking at options for uh, restoration, protection of natural resources, and development of the property. The Bader family in 2014 uh, started a partnership with Minnehaha Creek as they were looking at starting to think about selling the property and really wanted to determine what the options would be to restore and protect natural resources while also allowing for development options on the property. So uh, feasibility assessment was conducted uh, and it was determined that the site had very good potential for, for wetland banking. Uh, there's very deep organic soils out there and a long history of drainage and cropping. Uh, the assessment for development uh, also found that by preserving the 40 acres as a wetland bank, as open space, that that would actually allow for flexibility and development under the local zoning requirements. 
the city of Minatrista for typical developments did not allow very dense development. So by preserving the open space, it actually allowed for more lots. Uh, ultimately, a cluster development with 11 lots was approved as shown on the figure on the slide here. So at the end of the day, the project met both goals. Uh, natural resources were protected and a development plan was also approved. The site was eventually sold to a developer. And um, I think this last year, the final house was built. So it's completely built out. And the Maters kept the rights to develop the wetland bank and sell the wetland credits on the property. So Packy is gonna share uh, more on this arrangement and um, kind of the history of this collaboration during during his presentation as well. So the pre-restoration drainage conditions on the site, as I said, it was cropped and drained, pretty extensive network of drain tile, uh, a fairly deep open ditch that essentially removed all wetland hydrology from the site. Um, the, the concept plan for restoration was, was pretty simple. Uh, we broke the tiles in a couple locations and installed a outlet control structure and embankment next to an existing road. So site establishment was completed in uh, 2017 after the bank site plan was approved. The outlet structure, there's a concrete outlet structure with an internal weir wall uh, that connects to the culvert under the existing road. Uh, there was a challenge with the deep organic soils. We had to install the outlet structure on top of helical piers to keep it from sinking in the soft soils. Uh, the other part of establishment was, was flattening and the embankment next to the road and raising the road to provide freeboard during storm events. And then finally, vegetation establishment. Uh, the vegetation contractor actually started site preparation and vegetation management two years before restoration was completed. And that really allowed us to get a, a head start on invasive species control. And we also uh, got really good recruitment from the native seed bank. There was a lot of native species that came back as soon as hydrology was restored, which, which really helped us with the project. So this project yielded about 25 credits, most of them being in a large central shallow marsh, deep marsh wetland that was fringed with a wet meadow. And then there was a couple other smaller isolated uh, wet meadow areas that also received credit on the site. So here's the site before restoration, as you can see cropped and drained. And then after the site, uh, after restoration, um, hydrology came back almost immediately. I mean, within months we were, the hydrology was fully restored. And by the second year, um, the site was pretty much fully vegetated as well. So 2020 uh, represented the fourth year since construction. So the fourth monitoring year. And it's been a very successful restoration project. The final performance standards um, are already met and exceeded by the project. Um, as I said, wetland hydrology has been fully restored. Um, all vegetation communities are, are dominated by natives with a very low cover of, of invasive species. And that's resulted in the credits being deposited ahead of schedule as well. Um, we've deposited 80% of the credits after four years with the final 20% scheduled for this year. And as most of you probably know that work in the Metro, um, wetland credits have been in short supply. So the um, deposited credits have been selling soon after they're, they're deposited. So here's some examples of the uh, existing wet meadow areas. As I said, dominated by a diverse mix of natives, um, really good cover of uh, rice cut grass, manna grass, um, multiple sedge species. Um, I think we observed 47 native species in the, this community this year with less than 5% invasives. Uh, through all the control on the site, reed canary grass is, is almost non-existent in this community, which is great. 
Uh, same thing in the deep marsh, dominated by natives. Uh, we have had to do a fair amount of cattail control, but that's allowed the, the cover of cattail to stay pretty low as well. And the upland buffer as well is also dominated by a diverse mix of grasses and forbs. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to, to Packy to talk about um, his experience with the process. And thanks, Wes. Okay, uh, this is the TEP group walking through our uh, cornfield in 2015. And Wes is on the right there. And I'm sure he remembers this because I actually took a tape measure out and corn that year averaged 12 and a half feet tall. We had some stocks over 13 feet. Um, and it was just phenomenal growth that year. In 2016, it was a, uh, a uh, soybean field, and then the next year we were actually doing a restoration. So just wanted folks to get a look at what it was like just a handful of years ago. Thanks. Okay. And you can go ahead. Just a little bit of uh, repeat from what Wes said, uh, where it's at. Uh, St. Bonifacius is the closest town. It's Minatrista on the far western edge of Hennepin County. And Minneapolis, of course, is on the east side. Uh, that's an aerial view of our farm. The 40 acres on the south side are higher, higher land elevation. And then the 40 acres to the north side are lower. Um, compared to the presentation uh, that Dan just made, we, had, we have 80 foot difference in elevation within a quarter mile quite a bit different than the two foot elevation difference that he showed in over a mile. So it's called rolling farmland. Um, so we had to practice contour farming when we were farming the crops there. Okay. And this is a, shows the wetlands delineation that um, uh, Wes was talking about earlier. Um, one of the things as a landowner was the growth of learning we had to do because we literally went from knowing nothing about wetland credits and the whole process to actually, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're not that knowledgeable, but at least we're comfortable in discussions now. And it, so we just had a very high learning curve. Um, one of the things that um, was so vital was uh, we built a trusting relationship with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, uh, James Wicker, Whisker and uh, Courtney Hall were very vital in, in kind of holding our hand because we were just wading through it. Um, as a land owner, I would say the three things that were of most concern to us were the expense because all of us are modest salaried people. Uh, the next thing that was of importance to us was um, how long was it gonna take? And Wes pretty much laid it out very honestly and said he thought four years and it was. Uh, then the last thing is, um, uh, how were we going to do an exit strategy? And our brother-in-law, Dave, was really the engineer behind this process because we, a couple of us live out of state and many of our children live out of state. And we didn't want them to be saddled with long, long-term um, maintenance of it. So the idea is the homeowners of the developed part own that property. And once all the credits are sold, they are responsible for it. Um, so in about perhaps two to three years, they will be the ones who own and maintain it. We did set up an escrow for that group of $20,000 so that they at least have a pot to start with. Um, and we were hoping that they will do good management um, through, through in the future, but that'll actually be up to them. Okay. Um, and again, this is the 41 acres that were uh, restored and established. Um, it's wet meadow, shallow marsh, deep marsh. Uh, that's the seven of us, and that's the farmhouse we grew up in. Um, this is actually copied from a Minnehaha Creek Watershed District newsletter. 
Um, six of us continued in the project. Um, one is rather distant and had some health issues. So the other six of us bought her share out. And, you know, we were lucky that we're a tight-knit family and that we supported the project and stuck with it. Uh, that's not everybody's family dynamics allow for that. Okay. Again, this just kind of shows how it, um, where our farm is. It, uh, it is this section right here on the very western edge that's in yellow. Um, and it, our, we're actually, our farm is actually a source point for a creek that runs into Halstead Bay, which is, in my opinion, probably the most degraded bay of Lake Minnetonka. And then after, at the very eastern edge of Lake Minnetonka, for those not familiar with the metro area, is the start of Minnehaha Creek, which empties into the Mississippi River. Um, I've canoed the entire length of the lake and it tends to get more murky and degraded as you go west because probably because of more farmland and drainage into it, is my guess. Um, okay. And again, this is Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. And again, just a bit of a slide to show you its shape. And you can actually see the creek flowing here at the edge of um, Lake Minnetonka, Grays Bay. And as it goes through the suburb suburbs of Minnetonka, Hopkins, St. Louis Park, Edina, Minneapolis. OK. Um, this was news to me. I had no idea that they had aerial photos um, going back, in, I was guessing maybe to 1980 or so, 40 years, but Wes dug up this photograph of what that wetland area looked like in 1937. And it also helped us prove that it had a lengthy cropping history. Uh, when I was a kid, um, until I was a teenager, um, our that area that was restored was grazing land. It was pasture land for our cows and it was wet. Um, you always knew um, when they when we had too much rain because the cows came in with very wet udders and they were just muddy and it wasn't a pleasant situation. Um, but uh, then we tiled it in 1977. So it had been cropped for about 40 years when we started the uh, process. And Wes was able to come up with this document of proof of it. Okay. Um, this is another piece that as a landowner just at times was frustrating and uh, it was such an unknown because every time we did some kind of, we had some kind of meeting or needed a permit or an application, it was like this application was maybe $600 and then there would be one for 2000 and then another one for 1500 and the bills just kept piling up and piling up and piling up over the years and there's no income in sight yet and so I think if you are a consultant one of the things that you I know as a landowner we we appreciate it knowing what things would cost and how long it would take uh, here's an example I did this presentation uh, and a farmer from the sewer came up to me. He was very interested in doing this process. And he asked about how much it costs and how long it took. And he said, you know what? I, I can't do it. I'm in my late seventies. And if I would die, it would be in midstream. And none of my kids are around to handle this. So, you know, somebody with a good intention was not gonna be able to do this process because of the length of time and because uh, of the complexity uh, for some people. Okay. Um, this is another one. You'll recognize some of the names there. I saw Ben Meyer is on one of the co-hosts. Um, Melissa Jenny was very valuable from the Army Corps. Uh, Sean uh, Williams is the local government uh, unit uh, consultant, and they have been out at our farm. Ben Carlson and Ben Meyer have been out at our farm multiple times as part of a technical evaluation panel and observed it and um, been very encouraging. Everybody championed it. Everybody was collaborative. Uh, we, have, we have nothing but praise for all the groups uh, that we encountered through this process. And 
we tried hard to be good neighbors. That's another thing I'd like to stress. We actually, again, our brother-in-law Dave engineered this, but we approached all the neighbors and told them what we were doing. And we even offered in one case to do eight acres of restoration for them as well to get rid of the cattails and uh, reed canary grass they had and sumac and buckthorn at our expense just to build up goodwill and also to protect our land property so that we'd have less invasive uh, entering it. So uh, I think that was important too. It did mean more out outlay of cash, um, but in the end it's proved very valuable. Okay. Um, again, this is just, I remember we got a, the first one we got from uh, the comments, uh, Wes seemed a little thunderstruck. It was only like nine pages and he said that was a minimum, you know, it was just so little compared to usual. Um, Wes would probably remember the exact number of pages, but um, I have six binders that are two to three inches thick of all the data and all the reports through the intervening years. And that can, again, be a little overwhelming until you kind of grow into this process. Okay. Um, we had a fair amount of reed canary grass originally, as Wes mentioned. Um, we just used it for forage. We green chopped it and uh, it, it got sprayed. And you can actually some, see some of the neighboring properties here. Like they, had, they were heavy in cattails and that got sprayed too with these aquatic approved um, sprays. And the reed canary grass, as Wes mentioned, is just about vanished. The cattails are still an issue though. Okay. And these are some of the things again that we had to uh, address simply because we didn't know what, what was necessary when we started this process. But we had to have multiple surveys done. Uh, we had to do all these title clearances and get insurance, um, filling out these applications, um, and then recording these uh, wetland conservation easement. It, it was just all more steps, more expense. And uh, again, we had good people uh, explaining, us, explaining to us what to do and how to do it and when to do it. But it, it's just, it could, it could be overwhelming especially to a single person that's doing it or an elderly person, okay? Um, we tried to do little bit, of, little things on our own. Um, one was old fence lines. We, we found some that were buried. And, you know, when the prairie restorations came around with their equipment, we didn't want them to get injured or get their equipment damaged. So. We actually dug out old fence lines. Uh, we removed sumac, we uh, cut but buckthorn. Um, so we did try and do some things and, and even some old machinery that was around the area uh, just to get it uh, moved and uh, make it safe for anybody entering the property, okay? And here's, here was, the start of the rewards. We started finding these emergents that, um, that Wes and other people who were doing the um, evaluations and vegetation surveys would point out to us. Uh, we had literally not only thousands, I think tens of thousands of black-eyed Susans and wild bergamot. Uh, we were getting a lot of color. I remember one time Wes was surveying um, from a distance and he said, oh, it looks like we got a lot of thistle up on that um, west end. And I said, Wes, I know it's not because I hiked it yesterday. It's all wild bergamot. So it was really rewarding to see some color and wildflowers as well as the grasses um, reemerge. And mana grass just popped up just like that. Okay. Um, Wes showed you a little bit of this uh, structure. Um, again, just want to point out some of the expense of this, um, like that, that piece alone cost $15,000, I believe. And I still remember when we got an invoice um, to build this berm 
and it said mobilization costs. And I thought, are we going to war? I just had no idea what mobilization costs were. But they brought seven big machines like this out. And I told my siblings later, we got a bargain. It only cost $20,000 to haul all that stuff out there. But they had two backhoes, Caterpillar, uh, skid loader, uh, multiple tractors. It, it, it was quite the process. Okay. Um, we started getting wildlife back. We had uh, sandhill cranes come back. Three of them, uh, three sandhill cranes kind of took up residence in the wetland area. Okay. I love their sound. You can hear that. Okay, and then literally some days uh, you only saw a handful like this of ducks or geese, but there have been times when there have been 200 or plus uh, ducks or geese in the wetlands, and it's quite a sight. Okay. Um, Prairie Restorations was the firm that we had doing the seeding and the broadcast seeding. And again, it was all native, Minnesota native um, plants. Um, again, the sticker price sometimes, uh, it was $40,000 for the CD of the there. Okay. Um, and here is just a little sampling of the one little patch of the Black Eyed Susans I was talking about. And I think, I'm not sure that might be smart weed there too. Um, but, um, is, as Wes said, it's like close to 98% native plants now. Okay. Um, the butterfly weed and wild bergamot, um, pretty prevalent, especially the wild bergamot. Just a look out, um, the, the wetland restoration area is roughly a quarter mile by a quarter mile. So that's just over 40 acres. And that is a site, you can see the, where the outlet structure is uh, in the foreground. And then that's mana grass. And uh, then I think it's rye really took over in that, in some of those areas too, the drier areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, this was quite a sight for us. Um, at, since we tiled in 1977, I cannot remember seeing a frog in our uh, the area where they you, they were they, they had a strong um, presence in the previous habitat when it was grazing land. So the frogs just returned, just like the mana grass just popped up. The frogs came back in the spring. My brother couldn't even fall asleep from the uh, spring peepers. Okay. Um, and there's, I believe, Wes installing the monitors and uh, doing uh, doing some testing with them or measurements with them. Okay. And that's my, one of my brothers and my sister in the center and Wes, um, we received an award from the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Um, and it was just very nice of them to recognize us. Um, we are the only restored wetland or the only wetland bank in all of Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. And they really kept encouraging us throughout the process. And I'm sure at times they were wondering, when are we really gonna get on board? But we needed almost a whole year of education before we felt comfortable proceeding. And so that's kind of our experience as landowners. And if anybody has questions, Jack, um, I'm happy to try and answer them. Yep, we have one question here for you. It is, um, what is the best piece of advice you can give a consultant helping a landowner such as yourself who is early in this process? Um, I think the honesty, and, and Wes gave it to us. They, they, they kept insisting that it was a straightforward, very likely going to be successful project but it's not for everybody. 
if they're not comfortable with the expense or the time, or maybe their their bank uh, proposed bank just isn't going to be um, going to be that successful. I, I hope the consultants are honest enough to say, you know, I just don't think this is a viable project. And if it is, you know, keep telling them um, to beware of the expense and the time as they go along. And we, we, we were just very fortunate with all the people we've met throughout this process. And, and I think that everybody was honest with us throughout it. And that was very appreciated. Uh, we have a, a thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We need to hear more thoughts from landowners like yourself. Very much appreciated. Um, I would like to invite anybody who's interested in actually coming to it, especially those who are close to the metro area because it's it's so close. It's actually in Hennepin County. And Jack, if you're willing to share my email and, and I can forward it to my brother-in-law, Dave, who I'm sure would be happy to also and one of my brothers actually bought one of the properties there. Um, we're always happy to try and uh, show people who are interested uh, the lay of the land there. Sure, we can have it uh, some accessibility to that with the Will and Professionals Association uh, website, perhaps. That'd be great. Thank you. Would Would you do it all over again? Um, and would you do anything differently? Um, oh yes, I, I I certainly believe in it. Um, believe in the whole concept and um, I I wholeheartedly would do it again but I, I admit there were frustrations and there were times where I thought we're being we're trying to be uh, good stewards of the land here and it's going to cost us money it, it's actually being quite successful now financially but at one time I really wondered about it uh, the other thing I would like to just say is that um, it um, again, if you have people like we did, um, it, it makes it so much easier. And I was just fortunate having the siblings I have and Dave uh, shepherding this whole process because you got to stick together if it's more than a single person doing it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Our next forum will be on. April 7th, so watch for the announcements on that, and um, we we'll hope to see you all then.